Good morning. My name is Ryan Otis, and it is now my pleasure to moderate a panel on cyber, uh, cybersecurity, cyber defense. And uh, I must say the timing is very fitting, because if you know anything about software development, uh, the security aspect is kind of an afterthought very often, which is why we have this problem, which is why we need to talk about this, because we have so many things that are not secure, and those things affect our lives. <clears throat> Today we have a panel of five distinguished guests and uh, what I wanted to do is to uh, come up with an ordering of some sort and uh, the ordering I found was uh, let's order them by distance traveled. So first uh, we have a uh, representative from the uh, US Department of State, uh, Rose uh, Guttemiller. Uh, she will be followed by um, Brandon Valeriano from um, an island somewhere. Um, it turns out, actually, this is not technically true, because as you will find from his accent, um, he's not from that island originally. Is that correct? No. Yeah. Um, then I have two Germans, and obviously this is a problem when I'm ranking distance traveled. So um, we decided to solve this uh, as gentlemen, so I had, had them arm wrestle in the break before this. Um, I'm not saying who won or lost, but uh, this is the order. You won. <laughs> First, uh, Sandro Geiken, um, coming to us. Uh, I think you've worn many different hats uh, recently, but you're now with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany. Is that true? Yes. And uh, he will be followed by um, FX, Felix, uh, who is, I would say, the, the one true hacker on this forum. Uh, so if you have a very technical detail, you want to know how the buffer overflow attack actually happens, he will be able to explain this to you in excruciating detail uh, <laughs> until we run out of time. Okay? And last but not least, uh, if you do not recognize the gentleman um, in, in the final seat, this is probably because he's not wearing his trademark bow tie. But he is uh, the president of Estonia, Mr. Thomas Andrew Kilvas. Now, I don't want to steal any more of their time. Uh, they will each give their uh, thoughts first, and then uh, we'll hopefully have a very interesting and engaging discussion afterwards. So please, Rose. Thank you very, very much. And it's an enormous pleasure to be back in Tallinn. I always uh, love to visit here. And I'm usually coming here on uh, NATO business, uh, security business. And it's nice to be talking about well, an aspect of security, but one that I don't usually get to wrestle with. But I want to, you might ask yourself, what is the Acting Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security doing talking about this particular topic? <coughs> and what I'd like to do is talk to you today about what I think are very much two linked ideas. First of all, first idea is that the lessons of the arms control experience over the last 40 to 45 years really apply in very limited ways to uh, the issues of the information revolution. And I'll talk about that in some detail. Limited ways, I think there is some applicability, but it's not, uh, it's not a very clean story. But the second point I wanted to stress is that I do think that the information revolution applies to the future problems of the arms, of the arms control. Uh, efforts that we have underway, and particularly in the arena of monitoring and verifying arms control treaties and agreements. The last time I was here in Tallinn, uh, back in the late summer, I had an opportunity to, uh, to talk to some of your excellent students in the cyber arena and, and talked about these ideas, but I wanted to introduce them very briefly to this audience this morning. So let me begin with the first with the first topic. Uh, from the perspective of the U.S., no single set of measures can effectively address the range of threats to cybersecurity and stability. Instead, we must forge consensus and promote active international collaboration on a series of cooperative strategies that together address the transnational nature of threats to networked information systems. These efforts should affirm international norms, first of all, based on existing international law, that can uh, guide responsible behavior by states and be supported by active cooperation. And the cooperation f should focus in on confidence building measures designed to enhance predictability of state activities and reduce the risk of 
miscalculation among states. However, and this is the point I started with, we see traditional arms control measures as having very limited applicability in this arena. Why is that? First of all, information technology is ubiquitous and pervasive in its multi-use applications all around the world. By nature, it is neither inherently civil nor military, but its use depends entirely on the intent of the human actor involved. <coughs> Unlike with weapons of mass destruction, governments have no monopoly on the technology or the tools of attack. Moreover, as these tools are virtual and not visible, military capabilities can neither be counted nor assessed we could count big ICBMs, big missiles, big submarines, but capabilities in this area cannot be counted or assessed in the same way, nor can constraints be verified in any meaningful fashion. Further complicating matters, the identity of the perpetrators of attack can rarely be ascertained in real time or with enough high confidence to justify retaliatory action. Even should a perpetrator be identified, it's often impossible to ascribe sponsorship of an attack to a particular government or non-state actor who will want to maintain plausible deniability. Therefore, the United States believes that efforts to achieve an acceptable level of international cyberspace stability will be a continuing and dynamic process, and that realistic security objectives must be focused in the near term on uh, practical measures to manage and reduce risk and build confidence. At the same time, we are seeking general international acceptance of the norms necessary to establish and maintain a measure of cyber stability with respect to state behavior. This was the basis of the US approach to the 2010 UN Group of Government Experts discussions on information security, which concluded with two key recommendations. First, that states undertake further dialogue on norms, and second, that we engage in the development of transparency and confidence building measures in order to reduce the risks of inadvertent conflict resulting from misperceptions. In two weeks' time, we will engage in the final discussions of yet another GGE on this matter, where we are hopeful we can achieve consensus affirming the applicability of the law of armed conflict to cyberspace. And as we pursue further dialogue in, on international legal norms of this kind, we will develop and propose practical confidence building, stability and crisis prevention measures to be taken up in regional fora such as the OSCE, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ARF, and bilateral, bilaterally between states. Examples of CSBMs include identification of points of contact who can be reached quickly, exchanges of posture statements or published strategies on cyber policy, establishment of mechanisms and procedures for real-time signaling of intentions, and regular information exchanges to build confidence. So I think these are some of the, uh, the small areas that we are looking to, to draw from the experience of our arms control policy making over these many years to apply them to cyberspace. But it really is in this area of confidence and security building that I think we can draw examples from what has gone before. Now let me turn to the other topic that I wanted to address very briefly and perhaps draw forth some, some reactions from this specialized audience, and that is the applicability of the tools emerging from the info revolution uh, on the arms control policy making processes of the future. And here I think particularly relevant is the applicability of information technology to arms control verification and monitoring. And here I see two areas of particular applicability. The first is the arena of ubiquitous sensing and how we might use ubiquitous sensing to help us with some of our more challenging arms control problems in the future. In the past, as I already mentioned, we were focused on large items of hardware, ICBMs, submarines, bombers, things you could even count from outer space making use of national technical means, uh, satellites and over the horizon <coughs> radars. Now we're looking at smaller and smaller units of account. President Obama has already called for in the future placing limitations on warheads per se, warheads held in reserve in storage facilities. How are we going to get at the particular problems 
of monitoring and verifying small objects that are held in storage containers, held behind closed doors, behind walls. And here, I think this is an area where ubiquitous sensing uh, capabilities may come in handy, and we should be looking at ways to, to work this problem. In the case of Fukushima, for example, we already have distributed radiation monitoring on mobile platforms, particularly on iPhones, that's being used to track and trace uh, radiation um, contamination in the area of the Fukushima disaster. So that's you know just one example of what I am talking about, but I think the role of ubiquitous sensing, widely dispersed uh, sensors on mobile platforms mm -hmm. is something that we should be looking at with all the challenges that that brings to the problem. Second area is tools for inspectors, helping our inspectors to do a better job by having tools available, again, on mobile platforms available to them. This would be a completely new area to negotiate. As a negotiator, I'm not sure how easy it would be, but nevertheless, I think to have the ability for an inspector to map a facility before he goes into it could really help him or her to facilitate a more efficient inspection. I'm going to leave it at that, but look forward to our discussion. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm an academic. I come at this question from a unique perspective. I'm a positivist. I'm an empiricist. I am looking at the question of cyber conflict from the aspect of theory and data. I think that's a sorely missed aspect of how we are engaging this topic. So right now I've been working on a series of projects that seek to theorize about how cyber conflicts come about, what are the reactions to cyber conflicts, to quantify cyber conflicts, to look at the daily interactions between states as they interact in the cyber world. I think this is a needed step because I think we've gone too far with the construction of cyber threats. And this is one of the main areas of my research, the nature of threats, the nature of fear, and what these um, things do to relations between states. And I think for, one, for first off, we've gone a bit too far because we are in this mode, in this world, that we need something to fear. And we've moved from terror to the fear of the cyber world. And this is because we fear things that make us vulnerable. And of course, we're vulnerable in the cyber world. And of course, there are things that worry us. There's things that we have, to, we have to fear. But the reaction to fears, the reaction to threats, is the key thing that we need to consider at this time. And um, the main issue is that the reaction to a threat must be proportional to the actual nature of the threat. If we go too far, we can cut off the digital connections between this world that could actually be more beneficial. And this is the, the worry that I have about cyber conflict and cyber warfare. And often, threats take a nature of their own. <coughs> and um, they tend to overwhelm the actual reality of the threat. The fear that we have about things we don't understand, things that we don't control, can go too far. And this is why I think we need theory, we need data, we need real considered analysis about how cyber conflict is used in this world. And I think what we've seen quite often from the media is hyperbole and the inflation of the threat. And I think we need to return ourselves a bit more to thinking about what is the nature of cyber conflict. You know, the consequences of inflated threat can be very, very drastic. I mean, first off, we have uh, going back to the nuclear world, the construction of the military industrial complex. And now we're starting to see the construction of what you may call the cyber industrial complex. That of course we need to spend money on defense. Of course we need to spend money on basic cyber infrastructure. But how much money? How much money is too far? What happens when governments start to build offensive threats to perhaps provide for deterrence? And quite often, as we know, at least absent of the, the nuclear world, when you build up your military to deter a threat, actually that causes an inflated threat on the other side. That's what leads to the security dilemma. And I worry that we're going to start to see this in the cyber world, that the nature and the construction of the threat is leading us to build offensive weapons that will then provoke the other side to do the same. And then eventually, you will have what you call a conflict spiral. And that's the context for escalation that tends to be often counterproductive. And this is a big worry that we have. You know, currently, we, basically, massive cyber conflict is a taboo. And a taboo is something that causes revulsion on the other side, something that 
uh, a line that no one would cross, you know, similar to chemical warfare and nuclear weapons. So I think as of right now, cyber attacks have been very limited and lacking the severity that the news media tends to make them out to be. There has been a lot of reconsideration of Stuxnet recently and how far cyber attacks have gone. And quite often, too, when cyber attacks are successful, they are often uh, a weakness in the target, not so much about the nature of the, um, uh, of the tactic in and of itself. The data set that I have made about cyber attacks so far demonstrates that basically cyber options have been limited so far. Uh, among rival states, which are long-term historical um, enemies, I have only found that basically 20 of 126 rivals have engaged in cyber conflict, but found basically 106 incidents and uh, 44 operations or disputes, which are a series of incidents that would lead to some sort of overall cyber conflict, like say um, Olympic Games, which includes Stuxnet and other operations by the United States against um, Iran. These are cyber um, disputes, but you don't see these very often. Uh, the nature of the data in and of itself is very technical. It's very, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be done empirically uh, that hopefully will come out in publication, peer review, and form soon. But I, I've theorized quite a bit that often cyber attacks are almost the least the state can do. It's the simplest option. It's an easy option, just like economic sanctions. So, so far, we've seen them used quite limited. We've seen them used um, in, in such a manner that uh, it's surprising how little cyber attacks there have been between serious contentious enemies close to or engaged in warfare. And the other interesting factor is basically they've been limited to regional interactions, which is quite you know, uh, counterintuitive given the nature of uh, cyber technologies, that basically there's this idea that there's an attribution problem for cyber conflict. But when you look at actual cyber conflicts, they tend to be regional enemies basically based on traditional territorial types of regional threats. And I think this is why we need international relations theory, because what we talk about in the field of politics and in the field of international relations in terms of the nature of conflict and how conflicts come about can help us be very predictive about how cyber attacks and cyber conflict will occur in the future. The other interesting thing is when you look at the actual events and reaction to cyber attacks, it's also quite a bit counterintuitive. Um, there are very few types of cyber attacks actually produce a negative reaction in the opposing side. And the only one that really seems to raise the ire of foreign policy in terms of uh, raising the level of conflict is DDoS attacks, which as many of you know are probably the least a state can do. So that has been very interesting in that the behavioral nature of threats in the context of foreign policy is something that we have not really looked at. You know, we look at what cyber incidents are, but we really don't look at how they affect states. And we're starting to see these effects, and we need to really start to analyze them and see what they will do between states. But the main point is basically we really need to cut through the bluff, the bluster, and the hyperbole. We need to return to measured constructive analysis of the nature of the threat and be mindful that if we overinflate a threat and we overreact to a threat, things can be made worse than, uh, than the original intention. And we also need to ensure that digital communications are allowed to flourish and foster. There's a lot of positivity that can come through the internet, but if we restrict ourselves and put up walls to defend ourselves, that the nature of business, the nature of social communications can be forever irrevocably changed because of what we fear in this world. And I really worry about the reaction to cyber conflict from an offensive and defensive nature. Defensive being putting up walls and offensive being demonstrating capabilities to deter an attack. You know, I, in the study of the response to cyber attacks, I really like what Europe is doing in terms of building up resilience straight strategies. Assuming that cyber attacks will occur, how do you respond to those, how do you recover, and not seeking to, uh, to blame aside, to seek retribution, to look at yourself and look at how the attack came about, why it came about, and what you can do to protect yourself better in the future, as opposed to seek, uh, seeking out enemies 
and escalating the conflict, which could go further in the future. But for now, we've seen it quite limited, and I hope it stays limited in the future. So we'll see how this new technology develops. But so far, I do not really see a revolution in military affairs or a great change in foreign policy. What we're seeing now, though, is the considered measured reaction, hopefully, to cyber attacks. And we'll see how this develops in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. Yes, uh, thank you as well for, for inviting me, for having me on this excellent panel. Um, I've been working over the past year uh, for uh, my own Federal Foreign Office and um, been busy helping them uh, to design a uh, strategy there from the perspective of foreign affairs. So that's going to be something I'll be talking about without assuming an official position because the strategy is not fully published yet. Um, <coughs> But I think actually that, that foreign affairs have a strong uh, relation to this topic because, of course, cybersecurity and especially uh, military and secret service activity in, in cyberspace, which is probably the most dangerous uh, activity amongst the, the spectrum of things that can happen, have a very strong international notion. So it's, it's a very classical domain of uh, foreign affairs. And uh, contrary to, to uh, Brandon, I have to say that I believe that the threat is actually pretty, pretty big, pretty large. So some, uh, there are a lot of things you can think of what uh, militaries and secret services can do. And uh, I explored a couple of those based on the vulnerabilities which are simply there in the technical system. Uh, you can use uh, a larger military cyber hacking force, be it situated in the military or in the secret service to uh, generate influence on other countries. You can blackmail them. We had attempts like that already in the past. Uh, you can uh, look at strategies of erosion, rather unconventional strategies, economic operations, and, and try to weaken an economy over a period of uh, 15, 30 years. Some, some are considering uh, China to be doing that, actually, to have a, have a, st a strategic idea uh, behind this industrial espionage thing they're doing, becoming a, a world leader in certain high technology markets, and then becoming uh, economically uh, more powerful and also strategically more powerful. And of course, then you can say, well, then the whole industrial uh, espionage thing is not just purely a criminal activity, but also a strategic activity, one with impact, and one which needs to be considered from a foreign affairs perspective as well complementary to what is already happening. And um, so there are a lot of things you can do uh, which have a strong geostrategic impact. Uh, and uh, while none of those might reach this threshold of law of armed conflict or really one big blackout attack, and this is the point I think where I agree with Brandon that the media has been generating a lot of hype around this particular kind of scenario, that's not very likely because in that case you could also use a bomb and that's cheaper and quicker. And, uh, but there's a lot of things you can do um, given by the specific kinds of tactics which are offered by uh, cyber operations. So the anonymity, um, uh, the great amount of stealth you can enjoy um, while actually inside the system. So nobody thinks that, that something is going on, but you're actually manipulating very tiny bits of, of the system to your advantage. And these can, if you're patient, uh, I think these things can have a very strong impact and need to be considered. So uh, from uh, that, that then comes back to a conventional foreign and security policy perspective, where you have to consider it from that point of view. And, and so what do I have to do to keep my country independent of this kind of threat and this kind of influence and uh, to maintain international stability and, and peace at large? Uh, so what can we do from, from the foreign and security policy perspective? Well, we have one set of traditional tools, and, and uh, Rose has already uh, been discussing some of those. Arms control is one. Arms control has very limited uh, uh, application. It's very hard to enforce, and a lot of what, what you could actually control has a very strong dual-use notion. So if you monitor a guy like Felix, because he's constantly hacking things uh, uh, and, in terms of arms control, uh, then he's just actually finding the flaws of, of other programmers like Cisco and Huawei and publishing them. So uh, should I punish him for that or control him for that? Um, I mean, it's really hard to say where, where, to, where the, the line can be drawn between uh, developing a weapon and just simply looking at the system and finding the flaws, which you have to find to make the system secure and, and functional again. So that doesn't work very well. Then we have a very strong notion in Germany and in uh, the European Union on information sharing. Uh, which is good because uh, I think if you finally get the companies to share your information, you will get a lot of a lot more empirical data because I think 80% of the interesting stuff that's happening is uh, secret in the state and in the in the economy. 
So if we get them to publish that, we get a much better picture of what's actually going on. But then again, uh, that's not very protective. It doesn't, doesn't generate any protection. You know the, the attacks of the past, but you will not be protected against the attacks of the future. It does affect the, the business model of cybercrime guys because they cannot simply replay the attack over and over again. Um, but they've been successful at altering that and um, using polymorphic techniques and so on. So uh, I think the protective uh, effect is not that large. Uh, then the process of norms and confidence and security building measures is important too to generate a common understanding of cyber incidents so nobody tends to overreact on something and to generate some communication on that uh, because that is not happening at the moment. Uh, but again, I believe that due to the high anonymity you can enjoy in this field, uh, norms are not very effective. You cannot really enforce them, and uh, a lot of the confidence and security building measures are very contested, and uh, they're also not very effective in terms of uh, creating, generating uh, a protection as well. So all these traditional um, tools are not, they are all useful and good, but they're not working very well in terms of uh, actually deterring this kind of activity. Uh, then you can also turn to monitoring and forensics, which uh, I, I believe is everybody uh, keen. Every, everybody's keen to do, especially the superpowers are, are very keen to do that. Um, first of all, that that I think that conflicts very heavily, especially in Germany, with notions of privacy and notions of civil liberties to to monitor everything and, and just to sit in there and monitor it is enough for at least for us Germans to be really concerned about that. Uh, because we had two uh, dictatorships uh, working on this kind of uh, activity, so we're very sensitive uh, regarding that. Uh, but it's also not effective, and that's, that's one very important uh, uh, lesson uh, which I think the U.S. hasn't understood very well and, and other uh, major powers haven't understood very well, because there's so much you can do in this realm to actually uh, uh, spoof uh, your, uh, the investigators. Just to give you one example, a friend of mine uh, is developing a system for a country uh, that, that sits between an attacker and a victim and monitors everything they do. It, it, it monitors how the attacker attacks the victim and it monitors how the victim analyzes the attacker uh, to, to get uh, um, a, a footprint of the attacker and actually try to identify the attacker. So um, uh, say if you have the, the US and China, we have like this APT1 thing where you actually collect uh, uh, forensic data and uh, um, on incidents. Uh, then, then this would all be recorded, and at some point that tool would cut off the, uh, the line between the attacker and the victim and attack the victim itself and pretend to be the attacker. And it will play all the signals which the attacker, the original attacker, used to play, so to spoof you into this idea that it's actually China attacking you while it's somebody com completely different. So you have like 900 indicators. When you analyze that attack, you have 900 indicators pointing to China and 100 indicators, which are somewhat noise and hard to, hard to determine, and 10, 10 of these indicators are probably the original attacker. But then as a military decision maker, you have the problem, well, whom do I address? I have 900 indicators pointing to that guy and 10 indicators pointing to that guy. You're not going to address the, the guy with the 10 indicators. You're going to address the other one. So uh, that's a general problem with monitoring and forensics, and that's why I believe that this general strategic posture is not working as well. Um, so the, the larger question is, well, if the, all these traditional tools are not working very well, then what do we do? What's the general strategic idea that I can develop in this field to protect myself? And um, this now goes back to traditional security strategy and start from scratch and, and accept the tactics and the modalities of cyber warfare and cyber espionage and start from there. And um, I believe this is something where, where uh, we, we did some progress now in Germany, again, without stating an official position, but the, the strategy we came up with is to say that uh, we'll try to, uh, to do as much as we can to solve the technical problem at the basis, um, which is kind of in line with the general European attitude of generating more resilience. Um, but we we'll also try to, to do it in an unconventional way, because usually the conventional way to generate more resilience is to buy antivirus uh, industry products or spice them up somehow or get higher certificates. And so that's all very traditional and conventional. We don't think that that is uh, sufficient to any degree, especially when it comes to military units and, and uh, espionage guys attacking you. So we really, uh, uh, we have this idea that we should do the best we possibly can in terms of computer security. 
and generating and building a secure computer and a secure computing environment um, to solve this problem. And there's actually a lot of things you can do once you start looking at this whole problem from, from this very basic perspective, solving the technical problem and solving the vulnerability side of this problem. There's a lot you can do, and there's a lot which is not being done. We have a lot of uh, different architectures, Harvard architectures, moving target architectures, which we could implement. Uh, we have uh, a couple of security kernels, partition kernels, microkernels. We have tons of formal verification, all these things, good specifications. Uh, it's just not being done. So uh, that's, that's, and it has been considered impossible in the past because we're all living on Microsoft and Cisco and so on and so forth. And to change all that would be costly and inconvenient. But we think given the risks and uh, given the, the benefits we enjoy from, from computers, we should really try to move to an environment which is simply secure and, and maintain the benefits, don't have the risks of instability and surveillance and solve the technical problem and then uh, be done with that. So that's uh, the position we're having and, and uh, we hope to achieve something there. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Felix. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I want to touch on a few points. Um, the first being that um, since um, I, I speak to, to people outside of my technical domain and, and uh, inside the political domain, uh, I notice a very glaring lack of basic understanding and literacy on how this damn thing, internet, even works. So um, to put it bluntly, most people that seem to make decisions and policy in this area actually need someone else to print out their emails. Um, this, <laughs> this is not very helpful, and I'm very positively surprised about the, the level of knowledge that um, the president shows um, in discussions here. Um, if, if you're not at that level, stop making cyber policy, right? Um, this, this leads to a couple of very, very um, obscure ideas, and you know, if um, the, the element that Brandon touched on, the, what we call thought, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, um, is um, exaggregated by the fact that really few people actually know what they're talking about. This includes media, but also uh, political players, and unfortunately also people in, in academia, because um, the, the trick nowadays is if you have no funding and um, are in academia and you have no funding because you're relatively bad at what you do, you essentially sprinkle cyber over your next proposal and then money pours in. Um, which of course leads to uh, all the publications that come out uh, being not very helpful in solving the actual problem. Um, so uh, I'm not saying leave all that to the techies. Um, please not, like um, people, make policy, um, people that make policy and have experience in international relations should actually do that. However, um, they should have a realistic understanding of where the level of knowledge is and um, what type of consult consultation uh, they should seek. Because uh, by now, what happens is the consultation comes from a few large companies um, and their, their lobby organizations. Now, they do have their own interests, right? So um, if, you know, the, the antivirus industry, the entire industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, knows exactly that their products is, can provably not solve the issue. I mean, formally provably cannot solve the issue. Uh, Cybercrime is making fun about them. Militaries don't even consider an antivirus program any, any obstacle whatsoever. Uh, but those are the very people that heavily influence um, cyber policy. Uh, this is not a good idea. The thing uh, that I really like about the German strategy, actually, um, is that the, the major strategy decides many ways of spending money. And when you spend money on, on the right things, then you influence the future in a positive way, right? So um, the... When you look at, uh, for example, Obama's executive order uh, saying, well, we need to protect the country and uh, dear DHS, go ahead and try to find out what our critical infrastructure is and uh, we need information sharing and blah, blah, blah. But then when you look at where all the money of the United States goes is 
you know, there's the, the Air Force that spends like 10 times or 100 times as much money uh, on buying offensive tools uh, so they can hack everyone. Uh, because secretly, um, I still have the impression that the United States still hopes they can nuke IP addresses. Uh, and, you know, if, if I'm attacked from this IP address, I just nuke this IP address and then be good with that. Um, so, so the rhetoric and the spending are actually in two different ways, and this is not good. So um, I'm very much in, in support of what Sandro described as the German strategy. Um, you know, if we, if we need to spend money, uh, let's try to fix the basis. Because the problem here, again, being we shouldn't wait uh, or even listen to the industry. Um, software and computer products are the only product where you have zero product liability. So you can spend as much money as you want uh, on a program, and it will, first of all, display a large message saying, uh, um, I'm not guaranteeing that I even do what you asked me. Um, and if you ever used an Office product, you know what I mean. So um, that's a problem because you know, where should be the incentive to build even functional correct software, leave alone secure software? Uh, if we listen to those people that make money by producing a product that they are not liable for, uh, the things are not going to get better. Um, also, what I really like is um, going on the defensive side and not on the um, all-encompassing uh, surveillance and monitoring. If, you know, if you try to monitor everyone, then you're monitoring no one. Um, you produce a lot of data that uh, your adversaries usually steal from you. Um, and um, this, is, this is all not very helpful in the long run. You can't monitor everything. Um, also, recent research um, in, a, in a psychological side um, shows that you know, what, what everyone who has lived in a uh, non-democratic state um, already knows is that if you have constant surveillance, then this is causing actual harm to you and your thinking processes. So let's maybe not do that. Let's maybe uh, see if there's other options. Um, defense and, and defensive um, developments tend to have also less drastic escalation steps. This is also important. Like, you know, um, the, the offensive side um, escalates a lot faster than a defensive side. And um, we have to consider that um, the, from, a, from a pure research point of view, computer security defense is easily 10, 15 years behind offense. So it is pretty much impossible to build an unhackable computer today uh, if you actually want to use it for something. So um, that's kind of annoying. And, uh, the problem is that you know the, this this desire for more offensive tools actually doesn't support uh, changing this situation. So we're running into the situation where um, cyber is essentially the new nuclear, uh, like nuclear in the 60s. And so uh, the the recommendations we get are very similar to duck and cover, right? So if you see the flash, duck and cover. That hasn't helped uh, anyone with a nuclear strike. And the, the similar recommendations here. Uh, on the cyber side don't help anyone either. Um, so let's not repeat all the mistakes that were done in, in the nuclear age. Mutual assured destruction doesn't work in cyber because I need one computer to hack your entire country. So uh, what's, what's the point here? Um, and we have a, already a tremendous attack potential um, where essentially several countries can turn off the entire internet or, um, or an entire other country. So we have the offensive um, capabilities and no defense. That's exactly the same situation as you have with nuclear weapons and ICBMs. Um, and with that, uh, I probably would like to close on a note of um, the often cited anonymity, uh, where it's said either you're anonymous on the internet or we need full identification, so you have your personal ID, and then this is how you get an IP address to surf on the internet. Um, there is a lot in the middle. We don't need to add technology to the internet to know what country a attack comes from. Uh, this is by nature already built in. It's called the Internet Routing Protocols, uh, BGP4 in this case. 
So it is totally uh, possible to consider um, approaches that we use in environmental international law, like the extended producer principle, um, to apply that to cyber and say, look, if I'm attacked from this country, then this is the country I talk to, and then this country goes ahead and finds out if that's an internal attacker um, or if they're just used as a middle hop. This is all entirely possible, so we don't have to go full monitoring or complete ignorance. Um, there is middle ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Uh, <clears throat> Let me start off by saying I agree that sort of much, mo most of what you see in the media about cyber war is pretty much nonsense. On the other hand, uh, I would say, having been by inclination an empiricist even before I got to Barclay and Hume, uh, reading them, uh, I would say that uh, there's the other side, which is that, uh, well, there's never been a nuclear bomb after August 1945. Nonetheless, uh, the, the trillions of dollars spent uh, on nuclear weapons and preventing their use since then. In fact, there's only been two instances of nuclear weapons used in, in warfare since that time does not mean that it may not be used. So, I mean, so I'm not sure how useful the, the figure of 120 cyber attacks might be. Let me address five points here and not look at sort of the technical side of things, but rather how the world has changed thanks to the internet and cyber in the past five years. 20 years. First of all, one crucial thing is size doesn't matter. Uh, certainly the most influential book for me in all of this was reading a neo-Lodite, neo-Marxist tract by Jeremy Rifkin in 20 years ago called The End of Work, and the example he brings there is how the Americans had a steel plant in Kentucky with, with 12,000 employees. Um, the Japanese bought it and computerized and automatized it, and then they had a steel plant that produced exactly the same amount of steel, but with only 120 employees. So from an Estonian perspective, suffering from our collective <coughs> angst about our lack of size, this was the ideal solution to me. I thought you can increase your functional size simply by going as automated and computerized as possible, and in many ways that is what we have done with e-governance. Um, I mean, this leads to a form of asymmetry that, at least economically, that, that I mean, in an era of economies of scale, we were lost. I mean, 1.3 million Estonians, 80 million Germans, you know, what, there's no hope. On the other hand, you know, we can sort of do things now that we could not do before. So the first thing is that there is an asymmetry that has been now created in which that size matters less. Secondly, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, I mean, so there's one area where, cyber, where computers are a, an equalizer. The great equalizer, of course, was the Colt 45, and, the 19th century, but this is, it is an equalizer. It is also an equalizer in, um, in military affairs where, in fact, you can render a lot of things legacy technology if you want. Now, I mean, the reason, I mean, we have not seen attacks like this, but in fact, a clever fellow can, uh, or a woman, uh, can, uh, I mean, do all kinds of things. You don't have to go really deeply into the, uh, into the infrastructure and SCADA systems uh, that regulate your, uh, regulate your dams or water supply. Uh, I mean, think of New York City, London, Paris, and you just uh, turn all the traffic lights red, which you can do, I mean, if you want. So, I mean, in fact, you can paralyze a country with not much difficulty. Uh, you can immobilize a country, and basically, as with nuclear war and cockroaches, the, the more civilized and advanced you are, the less likely of, uh, your survival chances are. So that is, so we see a change not only in economic size or potential, but also in military. Um, a third change uh, which we've seen, I would argue, is that um, there's a different relationship between, I mean, in, in Traditionally, or warfare at least, since the 18th century, 17th century, states versus states. Uh, right now, we have this, uh, we see emerging a unique form of public private partnership, mafias working together with states. Uh, I mean, if you have, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, if you read um, Misha Glenny's book, Dark Market, on the, uh, the credit card hackers uh, in, um, that we're robbing everyone in the West. Uh, there's, he bring, there's an agreement which he brings out there, which is between the FSB, the, the KGB successor, and a, the mafia group in, involved in hacking uh, 
uh, or stealing credit card numbers, and it turns out they have a concrete agreement. A, they, the mafia agrees not to attack or steal any credit cards from the territory of the former Soviet Union, excluding the Baltic states. Uh, <laughs> Secondly, that uh, the FSB will therefore not cooperate and not prosecute them. And third of all, if they are ever needed for, if the hackers are ever needed for sort of service for the, uh, for the sword and the shield, they will do so. Uh, I mean, we see this, uh, you know, we see the deniability of, uh, of, of uh, various attacks from China, uh, the kind described in the Mondiant report about a month ago, which was a little sloppy, but nonetheless, they say, but we're not really doing this. These just happen to be student dormitories where they have a lot of hackers. Well, I mean, it's like with apps. I mean, people are not doing this out of the goodness of their heart and their altruism and nationalism. They're getting paid for it. So, I mean, apps too, I mean, which is a different topic. So, I mean, there's this, this kind of public-private partnership is new to kind of hostilities between countries. Uh, the fourth area where we see a major change, uh, I would argue, and, and we have not seen this in its full force yet, is in the entire concept of the legal guarantees for freedom of speech. The ITU exercise that we went through in the autumn here where, where you had uh, sort of, you could say, the, literal, the liberal democracies uh, saying we cannot have censorship of the of the net, um, and the number of countries that subscribe to that was exceedingly small, um, but Estonia is number one in the world in internet freedom, we of course did, Germany number two, US number three, but you know, there's, these countries, I mean there are a lot of other countries that want to restrict the internet and impose rules on the internet, uh, beginning with taking away sort of the U.S. controlled ICANN and then giving it to various authoritarian governments as well. I mean, we're going to see restrictions. Uh, I mean, the, the Internet, as we know up till now, may change uh, quite a bit in the future if we allow these kind of censorship uh, government, authoritarian governmental concerns uh, or interests take hold of what's on the Internet, though I personally believe what will end up is the two-speed Internet. I mean, it'll be the there'll be the, the so-called safe, uh, safe and uh, politically correct internet uh, where you can't say anything bad about any authoritarians and then there'll be the other internet that'll be full of porn but it will have freedom of speech. Um, and more bandwidth. <laughs> and finally, the final point that I would say that's, uh, that I agree here, and one of the things that uh, we need to keep in mind is that when all these paradigms have sort of had a sort of, not a shift, a nudge, is that what, what constitutes today uh, aggressive behavior? Uh, we, you know, we're, we're maybe too stuck in the atom bomb, nuclear bomb thing. I mean, uh, I would say that there's a, a much more subtle shift. Um, the, one of the best examples was brought by Sean Henry, former assistant director of the FBI in, uh, in testimony for the U.S. Congress two years ago was that he brings an example of a U.S. company that invested $1 billion in R&D for a new product over 10 years, and all of that work was sucked out in a weekend. Now, uh, what, what does this do? I mean, I mean, these examples are countless. Our own Skype, our own little invention here, gets like 30,000, 40,000 attempts to penetrate it a day. So, now, if... If, you, if the new Skype product or the, whatever, the new Microsoft product or maybe a new drug, whatever it is, if it's taken by someone else because they've gotten into your, sort of your company's system, uh, first of all, they get it for free uh, and then they can produce it for free. Its cost is al already a priori going to be lower because they haven't do done the R&D cost. And so there you are and they're producing something bef uh, because they've stolen it from you. Now, over time, as I, uh, you mentioned, I think, I mean, if you do this for 20 years, 30 years, I mean, the, the governments, or the, rather the countries that actually do the research, the R&D, are going to become poorer and poorer. Uh, and their, their competitive advantage will completely disappear because all, what's the point of doing R&D if you're giving it to someone else for free because they've stolen it? And I think that that will, um, that, when, that effect, of course, it's not a flash 
nuclear bomb that decimates a city, but it means that certain countries and the most creative ones will become poor and poor, and others will get rich for free. And so uh, uh, that we have to think in those terms. And I mean, is that cyber war? Is that cyber attrition? Uh, is that cyber crime? I mean, all as you said, the paradigms are slowly shifting. We have to think in different terms. Certainly, the latter problem I raised was uh, reach the UK government because four years ago I was telling them, look, let's do something together. And they said, we don't think it's a problem. Three years ago, it had become a problem. Finally, I went to Pauline Neville Jones, who was in charge of all this, and I said, well, so what's the shift? And then they said, we actually did a calculation of how much, how much we're losing in billions of pounds a year to, to theft. That's it. Thank you. Now, I know there's probably lots of questions in the audience, but I'll just start with a primer, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, you'll notice that uh, the panel is called Cybersecurity and Foreign Affairs, Managing Tensions, Maintaining Stability. And I want to look at the, the last two words, maintaining stability. Uh, do we really want to maintain stability at what we have right now? Are we happy with what we have right now? And if not, you know, can we get better? Uh, so some thoughts, if you will. How can we, let's say, breach the current status, status quo into some next level? Uh, is it doable, and if so, how? So could I start here in the beginning, please? Well, uh, I'd like to say pity the poor policymaker, because this is, and I think all of our panel members today have pointed out very well how fast moving this arena is. And uh, you know, as, uh, as policymakers, we have to think about how we can maintain and su sustain stability among states. I actually agree with the president. I think we have been too stuck in the kind of uh, nuclear exchange paradigm, and so perhaps have been thinking too much of the history of nuclear deterrence and how it has affected policymaking over the years. Nevertheless, as I indicated in my remarks, I do think we need to look carefully and judiciously at lessons to be learned from, uh, from that history. And particularly, I take it from the history more of the, uh, the arms control side of the house with limitations, that there are some tools of confidence building and predictability uh, measures that can help us as we are in this uh, transitional but very fast moving area as the paradigms are shifting and people are getting their heads around the, the realm of new and difficult policy uh, problems that we are confronting. So I guess I am, uh, I am urging us all to consider that there are some roots uh, in the previous era that can help us out, but we should not slavishly try to take that experience and bring it forward to this set of problems. Because the problems, for one thing, are not fixed at the moment. They are rapidly evolving. And there is no way that, that we can, in some sense, freeze them as we attempt to apply policy measures to them. But nevertheless, the poor policymaker, as a responsible actor, we hope, in trying to sustain and maintain stability among states, must do something. So we look at every tool that we have available. If they are inadequate to the task, then forgive us, but we are doing our damn best. Let me say, on, I mean, the traditional way of maintaining stability in foreign relations is to get agreements or treaties, uh, conventions. Uh, there are two major efforts in this regard. The first one is the Budapest Convention, which is the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, which obligates its members, uh, the states, to participate and assist in, uh, in criminal investigations. Um, and it's actually a very good convention. Uh, curiously enough, for a Council of Europe convention, it has not been acceded to by a number of European countries, most notice, notably Belarus and Russia. Uh, and at the same time, it has been acceded to by a whole number of liberal democratic countries that are not in Europe. I mean, the United States, Canada, Japan, the Philippines. So, I mean, what's wrong with this picture, to quote someone here in Estonia? Um, why is this? And uh, in fact, 
uh, this is, would be a very useful tool for, for precisely the kinds of things that Misha Glenny describes in Dark Market. I mean, you have a criminal gang. The problem is the states don't want to accede to this because it would mean that they would, in fact, have to be obligated to assist in apprehending the people they are, in fact, employing. Um, now, the other, pro the other major effort has been the, uh, the sort of the proposal by uh, sort of what, I, mean, I don't know, how to characterize this group of countries, but uh, I mean, most uh, sponsored most by um, uh, most prominently by Russia and China, uh, that would in fact then limit. I mean, which was proposed at the ITU, that in fact would lead this, the thing I talked about before about sort of uh, you have the safe uh, internet and then you have the unsafe internet, and liberal democracies would be have the unsafe internet. Now, uh, at least one of the, uh, there's not much to add to that except, I mean, if you want internet governance so that you can't say anything bad about any authoritarian government, the, uh, um, the selling point for this and, and why there were more people actually supporting the censored internet than were supporting the free internet was that uh, the deal made to a number of countries where unfortunately leaders don't know anything about IIT was that if you take this, uh, this is, if you take this, this if you support the, uh, this idea that there will be internet government, we, the Chinese and the Russians, will provide you with uh, cybersecurity, a cybersecurity shield. In fact, by not hacking you. <laughs> well, well, who knows? But I mean, of course, I, I, I always say that Huawei gives a new meaning to the term Intel inside. Yep. But anyway, the point is that there are two agreements so far. That's usually how stability is maintained. Um, and the problem really does, I think, come down to, in a lot of cases, the fact that the awareness of these issues is fairly low at the political level. It's not so bad as you said. I think it will increase, uh, I mean, it will increase dramatically with generational change. Because now, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it will change. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think I want to make the point that the cyber world so far has been more stable than we probably expected it to be, and that's why we need data, because we need to understand the recent history of events to understand how we respond to these events. And I think the other thing, too, is there are norms in cyberspace, and norms are not about enforcement. What a norm is, the shared standard of behavior, and we need to enfranchise positive norms in cyberspace, and the danger is and going too far in securitizing cyberspace and overreacting to the threat by making it worse by building up offensive weapons. I think that's the real danger. And there's a lot of basic things we can do that people don't do, like update the security browsers, update the security software, not clicking on links. I mean, these are the types of things that would be the first step. And we haven't even done that. But we're already jumping to the extreme steps of building cyber armies and I think this is the path where we can go down towards ruin and what might be cyberspace if there is a such thing as cyberspace. Quick comment and then Felix. Um, yes, sir. And so I think the, the situation we have right now, what, what your question was, it's actually fairly fine. I mean, um, the, uh, right now we, we already have the situation that uh, most people intuitively, even in, in policy making, handle the internet as something like a global common, like the seven seas, right? So everyone uses it, and uh, this should be protected. So this is actually an, an approach that I um, really support. However, we also need to look at, um, at control and how we handle that. And um, the, the examples given about the ITU are, um, are very specific. Also, um, thanks for, for picking on Huawei. Um, they're not the only ones, but um, there is something that, that we call second colonization. So essentially what you do is you, you provide a product um, that people need for large infrastructure projects, digital infrastructure projects, and um, it happens to be cheaper or half the price than all the competing products, which could be subsidized by the state, but you never know. And then if everyone bought it, it's the perfect situation because if you're in peacetime, then you know, your country makes money, and if you're in a conflict, then you essentially turn off their internet. Uh, so this is, this is things that need to be monitored because we have, we have not looked at those in the past uh, because the, all the control was with the United States, and we were fine with that. 
you know, the, the United States military paid for the internet to be invented, and then porn made it big. But um, you know, we, we accepted their complete control over the internet. Now that there is more players and especially other ways of you know, getting into a control situation, like providing the equipment that runs over 50% of it, um, we need to reconsider such uh, situations on, a, on an international scale. Please. Yeah, this is paradigm. There's another thing we have to keep in mind. I mean, it is not, I mean, this is, uh, hostility is not domain specific. There are three examples. First of all, I mean, the, the Georgian War, 2008, the, uh, before the uh, kinetic attack, as we now call them, used to be just attacks, but now they're kinetic because they move in space and have, you know, impact. Uh, in areas of the Georgian War, I mean, during the Georgian War, there was a, an internet blackout that was done through DDoS attacks. So we're already seeing the combination of air, air and ground warfare now transferred to cyberspace. Uh, and it's, it's nicely written up in two articles in the Small Wars Journal of January 2011. Um, now, the uh, May 2011, the U.S. DOD or Department of Defense uh, said that uh, they no longer consider it obligatory to respond to a cyber attack uh, in the cyber domain. Uh, so basically, you know, you could, you could just be blown up if you do something and you're identified. And then, of course, the other thing is the recent, during the recent Iron Dome missile attacks when Anonymous was, be, was hacking Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces put out a thing saying, you know, you people are involved in a war. Be aware that you are involved in a war, period. <laughs> now, uh, I mean, I think the message was fairly clear <laughs> that, uh, that they would not respond in cyber kind. Uh, and given the history of the Mossad and their sort of activities around the world, I think the message was fairly clear what, that, what they were talking about. So the thing is, we, when we say there was a cyber attack, and you know, I used to worry myself, uh, what, what, according to Article 5, is the appropriate and the sort of uh, uh, proportional response to a cyber attack? Well, unfortunately, it turns out there is no appropriate and proportional response to cyber attack. Anyone can do anything. Okay, <clears throat> with that, let's open the floor up for questions. There's a question over there. And let's, let's take two or three questions and then do a round of answering. Okay. Can I ask two questions? Yeah. My first question is for Brandon. You referred to Stuxnet and you said that, if I heard correctly, it was an American initiative against Iranian facilities? because it was the first time I heard it. Is it just it is. a guess or we know Reed more David about it? Sanger, I don't know. Pardon? Uh, I'm not an American government representative, so okay. <laughs> leave me uh, out of this, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that. <laughs> um, um, perhaps you have heard about, my other question is for Flix. Perhaps you have heard about the operations of the so-called Iranian cyber army. Uh, I'm Hossein Bassani from the BBC World Persian Service. Uh, I want to quote Eric Eschmidt, the executive director of Google. Uh, he said in December 2011, he was explaining about the activities of Iranian hackers and Iranian government, etc. He said that Iranian hackers had succeeded in diverting the flow of information in Denmark towards Iran and then return it back to Denmark for a period of time. Uh, I would like to ask, is, it he, is he exaggerating or is it possible from the technical point of view diverting the flow of informa information in another, another country and then returning back to your own country? And if it's the case, if it's not exaggerating, uh, perhaps I should address this question to Mr. President. If it is proven that a country has done such an operation, what is the maximum reaction we can expect from the international community? Thank you. So, okay, we? a question in the front there. François <coughs> Géré from France. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you a question about uh, the use of CERT. I think among the, the measures of uh, protection and the measures of recovery, uh, CERT and cooperation among CERT should play 
a great role and a greater role. But, uh, for instance, um, the, uh, every t twice a year, uh, the National Chinese Cert publish a report on the situation of the internet in China. It's an excellent, excellent report which gives you a picture of the evolution of cyber in China, but also a picture of China itself. Uh, at stake is the cooperation between uh, Chinese national cert and uh, other cert in Europe and in the United States. But that kind of initiative can be damaged by the evolution of the relationship between the two countries, I mean China and the uh, United States. And uh, I would like to have uh, your opinion uh, on the impact of reports such as uh, the Mandiant report in the US, which has triggered uh, measures from the US Congress against Huawei. I'm not saying that Huawei is perfect in all the aspect of its behavior. But as a result, Huawei decided to withdraw from the American market, which is not good news in the sense that it seems to me that if we want to improve and to reduce, for instance, cyber espionage, more cooperation, and more uh, economic uh, cooperation between the two countries is welcome. And if, they, if we build fortress uh, America, cyber fortress China, and so on and so forth, we will reach uh, precisely that situation we would like to avoid. Thank you. Thank you. There's two questions in there, and then we'll go with the answers. Please show your hands. Tomasz Walaszek, Slovak ambassador to uh, NATO. Um, while I do um, read my own emails, I don't have them printed out for the records, I'll freely admit to being a beginner on cyber. Um, question for, um, I guess, all of the panel inspired by President Ilves. As a beginner, I'm instinctively attracted to the notion that we ought not to have two separate internets for the reasons that the president's laid out. Uh, equally, I've heard, however, a, a fairly con convincing argument in favor of, of, of a separate internet by Mike Hayden at the, uh, at the uh, Munich Security Conference two years ago. Uh, he argued for it on the grounds that the, the existing architecture is, physically, is, is simply so flawed that it is physically impossible to guarantee any level of security uh, with the existing hardware and software. And if we want to have any uh, secure communication whatsoever, we need a completely physically separate uh, a, a new internet. Internet 3.0 is, is what he called it. Uh, it strikes me as an official that if, if that's the answer, we, that it's something that will cost a lot of money and will probably take a lot of time. So we ought to have clarity on whether this is the way forward. So I'm throwing the question back at the panel. Is a separate internet physically perhaps disconnected from the current one? The answer, the only way to provide security, physical Disconnect didn't seem to have done much wonder for the Iranians. I understand their system was off the grid and was penetrated anyway, so I read in the New York Times. Um, and if the, uh, in, if the answer is, is no, is there, you know, is, is, is there any way of physically providing security on the internet, or is it simply the case that, uh, that it will always be a domain in which the offense will be 15 years ahead of, of the defense? Okay. Question there? Yes. Begos Polis, Latin MOD. I have a question. Uh, to President Ilves and also to the Rose Gotemuller. Uh, when saying that Russia and China is not party of the Budapest uh, Cybercrime Convention. Is not a party. Is not a party, yes. So my question is, have you heard perhaps the European Commission or there is there discussion in the European Council from one side and then perhaps from American side that you could make or contemplate making Russia in a, in a future as trying to be a part of that convention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start with the, the Iranian question. Felix, would you like to give a 60-second crash course on what BGP routing is? <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me first answer the, the Stuxnet question. Um, 
because among us here, I'm probably the only one that actually read the code of Stuxnet. Um, yes, it's an American operation supported by the Israeli. Um, now, uh, Stux, uh, uh, the, the question with Google is, look, Mr. Mr. Schmidt is one of those people I referred to earlier that actually has a very large hidden agenda when speaking to any government because Google actually has the largest control power in a single company on the entire internet. Um, so the reason he's saying stuff like that um, is actually because of his own interests that are not entirely transparent. However, um, is it possible? Yes, totally. Um, is it being done? Rarely, because uh, operations of that scale are very, very visible. So um, it happened that, for example, uh, Pakistan once took uh, ownership of YouTube. Um, so suddenly, for all of the internet, YouTube uh, moved to Pakistan, which you know, all of the internet noticed because there wasn't any cat movies more. You know, they, they couldn't see cat movies, um, and and you know, the the, the porn looked funny. So uh, this is very, very visible. So even if you do what, what is called a BGP for man in the middle attack, uh, which is relatively hard to pull off, every network operator in the world will see it within seconds. So uh, can it be done? Yes. Have the Iranians done it? Probably only a very short amount of time uh, to show that they can do it. Hooray, you understood routing. Great. Um, and is it, is it something that is commonly done or over a longer period of time? No. Um, if I may uh, go to the, to the third uh, versus Mandiant uh, question, um, this, is again, um, this is again a question of agenda, right? So uh, of course Mandiant is simply uh, trying to sell their services. Um, and uh, as you know, certs are not really clusters of competence uh, when, it, when it comes to computer security core issues, um, but they're very, very important, and cooperation is a very important thing. Uh, however, you mix up the timing because the, the decisions the U.S. Congress made on Huawei were half a year before the Mandiant report, so there is no correlation, no, no cause and effect here. Um, however, some of my research might have caused some of the <laughs> Huawei uh, decisions to be made. Um, I think that international cooperation uh, of, of certs um, is something that we actually need to expand on a global scale, uh, but also international cross education. Like you know, the, the certs tend to not educate each other uh, on things they understand or vulnerabilities they find. They only talk to each other about um, you know who got hacked. And one last sentence to the question of the second internet. Uh, those, are, um, those are two different things. Uh, so, so in networking, we talk about different layers. Um, is, the, the internet, is the equipment that we built our internet with currently um, horribly broken and needs to be thrown out and replaced? Yes. Can we build another internet in parallel and not never interconnected? No. Uh, trying to air gap, gap networks never worked. Air gaps do not exist. So, you know, even the Iranians found out the hard way that a single USB stick can actually uh, get the malware into your nuclear facility, although they're not surfing porn from their nuclear facility computers. So, um, yes, we need new equipment, and this is exactly what, what Sandra was about, uh, but um, this is not going to be a second internet, and this is the transport layer. This is like the water in the ocean. Uh, do we filter? E.g., do we have uh, ships patrolling? Do we have a do we have a sea blockade? Um, you know, do we filter according to Chinese rules or uh, Russian rules or German rules? That is an entirely different question. It, you know, one is the medium, one is what you do with it. Okay, first there, and then starting here. Let me just on certs. I mean, they can be incredibly useful. Uh, the fact that Estonia, before having its first uh, uh, first computer or uh, computer-based elections uh, in 2007, uh, we had uh, we did we gamed being attacked. 
uh, with DDoS attacks. And through that, it became clear that we needed to have much closer cooperation between the certs. In fact, when we had our first uh, computer-based election, we were not really hacked in a major way, even though we thought we would be. But uh, six weeks later, we were attacked in a major way in a DDoS attack uh, uh, regarding the Bronx soldier in 2007. And there, the fact that we had already gamed massive DDoS attacks and the certs cooperated was very useful because, in fact, it lessened the impact tremendously. And moreover, then when the Georgians were uh, subjected to the same kind of DDoS attacks uh, that were, would, uh, had far less of an effect than, the, uh, than uh, they would have otherwise had because we had already gained the experience and, they, and we provided mirror sites and all kinds of wonderful stuff. But let me talk about the fundamental issue on cybersecurity because it also addresses your question. The, for, the Fortress America, Fortress China is, is the wrong goal and it won't happen. I would say you should, you should depart from the principle of my device is my castle. Uh, and this is possible. The United States has developed something called NSTIC. It's, a, it's, called, it's the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace and that's the goal. It's a 12 point uh, 12 point program like the Alcoholics Anonymous program, they have managed to do three of them, or maybe now four, I don't know. Uh, this was published a year and a half ago. We looked at it and we, and we discovered to our amazement that we, in fact, in Estonia, had done all 12. Now, the un ultimate and final issue of cybersecurity, aside from the messy things like DDoS attacks, uh, is identity. Because you are living in a, everyone in the internet is living in a bad neighborhood. I mean, imagine you're living in the South Bronx, at least the way it was when I was an undergraduate. And, you're, and your doorbell rings. This is like someone writing you an email. And then you, you say, who's there? And then, you know, your uh, significant other says, I'm here, honey. And then you press the button and you let him or her in. Um, but the problem is that maybe there's, uh, there's, a, there's a drug addict there with a tape recorder saying, it's me, honey, and you've let in a criminal into your apartment house. This is, an, and I mean important uh, apartment house because uh, they get into your whole scheme. And so this is an issue of identity. Who is it that you are talking to? Who is it that is approaching you? And unless you have a trusted identity, as in NSTIC, I mean, you are letting in by clicking this, that, or the third thing, you never know whom you have just let in. Are they, have they put in a keystroke logger? And so that every, in the more the equivalent of the thief entering every apartment in your apartment house, because once the, your eternal mails, you spread the keystroke logger. You must know who it is that is getting, who you are letting into your computer. And there are ways to do this. They're a little bit inconvenient, or certainly not nearly as convenient as, as the current system. But unless you deal with the issue of identity, who is who, um, basically you have a lot of masked bandits out there, and, uh, and you're letting them in out of naivete. Okay. Thank you. Please. I just wanted to say uh, something very briefly on the cert-to-cert -cert cooperation, which I do think is very, very important and is an aspect of early confidence building measures that we've been trying to build up uh, bilaterally in a number of cases. But I wanted to point out again uh, this interesting legacy benefit that those who have been involved in the arms control arena get from that experience. With the Russians, for example, we have well-established protocols for notifications and communication. For example, we have the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center, which basically takes notifications flowing from various arms control treaties and uh, you know, gets them out to the Russian interagency. And you think, oh, that's a small thing, but it's now a well-established mode of communication between and among capitals. In the case of Beijing, there's none of that legacy. And it's taken a lot of work and time to kind of talk about what you need to have an international system of communication and notification and make sure then that the notifications get out to every place they need to go in the Beijing interagency. So I just wanted to point out that for those countries, even though we may have different views overall 
of uh, the role of the internet in future and this important issue of, of freedom of information, freedom of, of uh, internet uh, access. Nevertheless, uh, I think there are some important effects from the legacy of the earlier era that are helping to build up um, the confidence building agenda for some countries and are making it a little bit more difficult for some other countries uh, to be involved. But I think we're gonna keep pushing this agenda and I 100% agree that cert-to-cert -cert cooperation is important in this regard. The last thing I will say with regard to the question about the Budapest Convention, of course, we're trying constantly to get the countries who are not in the convention to join up, to become involved. But I did want to underscore once again that there are other negotiations and activities going on, like the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and its efforts. It's been some real fisticuffs there, again, with the Russians about how to proceed. But you know we're pushing that rock uphill, trying to make progress. The ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the ARF, and, and then bilaterally with a number of countries, including those who are not so enthusiastic for the, uh, how would you put it? Mr. President, the, uh, the non-safe internet. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's an interesting idea. <laughs> Thanks. The free Thank internet. I think one thing that's come out quite a bit here, and uh, Felix made the point that, uh, can we really trust these security companies? Of course, academics have a problem in that they really don't know what they're talking about. And I completely agree with you. I have never accepted a cyber paper or a cyber book myself. I don't know how these things are floating through. But on the other hand, why, can, why are we accepting security company reports at their face value? Because they obviously have an interest to report what they are reporting. And this is why I want to bring international relations and politics back in. Because there are root causes to all these cyber disputes, all these cyber interactions uh, beyond crime. But for the international policy uh, perspective, there are root causes that we really need to get at that bring about these uh, situations in the first place. And we're overlooking these by moving towards securitization of cyber world and not looking at trying to solving the differences between countries in the first place. Sandra? Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at the, at the core problems, I, I very much agree that the, the, the industry is actually part, a big part of the problem. I mean, if, if we look at it from our perspective, and uh, we want to do the, the technological change, the change of the technological substrate. Uh, the biggest problem is not identifying the technologies or identifying the research, is identifying a, a, a market strategy, an industrial politics strategy to actually get the market to change this environment and, and to accept uh, high security computing because there are a lot of negative externalities in this market which makes insecurity much more profitable than security. So that's one of the bigger problems we're having uh, the large path dependencies, and at this point, I have to disagree with with Euros. Unfortunately, uh, from a lot of talks we had in the in the U.S., also with, uh, especially with researchers uh, at MIT, for instance, or uh, um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, you did not do your best. You ignored your best. You had a lot of uh, very good computer scientists who pointed out to you that there's a lot you can do in the technical realm to solve this problem technologically. Uh, but what they told me, Butler, Butler Lampson, for instance, said that once he's a Turing Award uh, winner, so a very high person in the computer security, uh, computer science community. And he said every time he went to a policymaker and told them, this is what you have to do to solve this problem, after him, 10 lobbyists from the IT and the IT security industry went in this office and said, no, that's not what you should do. That's ivory tower stuff from these academics. Buy our products, but you're much better off despite the fact that buying their products caused the problem over the past 30 years. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I think this is the, the biggest problem probably we have in cybersecurity, and also in this international cybersecurity, military espionage cybersecurity, are the very high path dependencies in the industry, uh, the legacies of uh, the large IT companies and the IT security companies, which of course thrive as parasites on these open wounds and vulnerabilities of the conventional commercial IT companies, and, and the, the huge amount of lobbyism going on. And, and the one, then, if, then you can identify another interesting problem. Uh, everybody agrees that uh, IT security and cybersecurity should be a multi-stakeholder thing. And that's probably the worst decision you can make. I mean, when has it ever been that national security is multi-stakeholder? And you ask Siemens to actually provide the nuclear strategy because they provided the door locks for the facility. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what's happening in, in cybersecurity. In any meeting I've been to in Brussels, there's always been two people from Microsoft and three people for, or two people from Symantec at the table. 
And whenever the clueless policymakers had some question that was slightly technical, they were looking at uh, or glancing at the Microsoft and Semantic uh, guys to, to tell them what's technically possible. But of course, it's Microsoft and Semantic only tell, told them what's profitable for Microsoft and Semantic and not what's technically possible. <laughs> so um, I think from my point of view, uh, as somebody who wants to change the, the technical environment to, into a good environment, that's the core problem. And that's a problem which is not addressed enough. I thank you for pointing out this conundrum. And it's very important. And it is an important insight for me out of this panel, I must say. But I will also say that what I was talking about are traditional tools of policy and how we've tried to apply them in this sphere, as inadequate as they may be. The technical problems you pointed to are extraordinarily important. Again, I thank you for pointing them out to me. But uh, what I was talking about is, is what can we learn from the past in our policy-making toolbox and apply it to this problem? OK, <clears throat> we have time for one more quick question or comment. Could you please take the microphone? Uh, Jan Prisalo uh, from Estonian Information uh, System Authority. And I wanted to, to question that uh, nowadays our uh, cooperation mo uh, model or, or no, our protection model in the critical infrastructure is that we are teaching those infrastructure uh, companies actually to handle their affairs and we are, we are getting the specialists into there and, and uh, no, trying, uh, trying to, to raise their, their cyber knowledge so they are able to defend themselves. Uh, but if this critical infrastructure and SCADA systems actually are going further, uh, uh, so into the homes, because we can save the, 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 the heating bills two or three times because of that, into the, into the logistics with these UAVs, uh, into the cars and stuff, then uh, this model doesn't, doesn't scale. We cannot teach everyone to be the cyber expert. It's simply not possible. So what can be the, 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 the model that works? Uh, what is the government role? And what is the, uh, uh, what is the military role in this model? Thank you. At this point, quick admin question. Can we follow this up? Because we're out of time. Yes, OK. So very, very quick response to this last question, please. Let's start there. Uh, well, uh, adopt a, uh, a two-factor PKI system and not open anything that does not have a digital signature attached to it, which also requires a legal basis with a, that it gives you, that gives you something. Um, <laughs> don't attach an, an ID to everything. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually very opposed to that idea because we haven't figured out how to build computers where your ID doesn't get stolen or uh, let's say decentralized backups in Asia, uh, and IDs are really, really bad to recreate. Like once yours is stolen, it's gone. So uh, build better base computers and disallow, uh, disallow selling SCADA systems and in, in critical infrastructure, as, as you call it, uh, without liability. Uh, yeah, you've touched on a very interesting point, which is very troublesome in Germany as well. Progress is the enemy of security, especially progress in the IT area because the IT guys are not very inventive as of late, so the only idea they have is network everything with everything and it's going to be good for something. However, the, the uh, security concept of many uh, traditional production machinery, SCADA, critical infrastructure has been don't connect it to the internet. And that was largely the only security measure they ever, ever, have ever had. Everything beyond that has never been designed with any kind of security in mind. So now if you've got this huge new trend because you have to sell IT for some reason, uh, that you have to network everything to everything, all of a sudden the, the security regime you had and the security ideas you had co collapses entirely. And they didn't come up with any idea uh, to provide security. Of course, they say, okay, well, then you buy the firewall and you're fine, but of course you're not. And it's a really big problem in Germany at the moment because they have this idea of industry 4.0, which is exactly networking everything to everything. Uh, and they, they didn't consider security to the slightest. We know, we know that. And that they're, they're about to introduce so many new problems uh, that we're having a really hard time arguing against that. But then there's so much money to be made with this, and that's the big industry, German heavy machinery industry player behind this, it's going to be a very difficult political uh, haggle. Just because something can happen does not mean it will happen. 
We can't base policy on worst case scenarios. That's the worst way to make policy. And I see that happen so often in cyber and this is the problem I, I kind of feel we're moving down the wrong road right now. We're, we're moving down the wrong path. Okay, and last words please. Oh, I have nothing to add except once again, this has been an extraordinarily um, eye-opening discussion for me and I'm grateful to my colleagues uh, for the discussion, but I will continue to argue that at least in some small sense, the tools of policy available to us will continue to have some applicability in this sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much.